Very good. Thank you very much and for the presentation and for the opportunity to be here today. I will be talking about, uh, about swine influenza. Uh, first of all, I want to try to convince you that the swine influenza is very important and as in the place of this presentation is second important after PERS. Uh, first PERS, second flu, and certainly PED now as well but very important, and it's very common in pigs, causes respiratory diseases, but it's also found everywhere, really, when, when we look for it. As in the case of PERS, there are multiple strains and subtypes which makes control of influenza very difficult, and that's why we are here today. The other thing I want to emphasize in the case of influenza is uh, that it's not limited to pigs. It also affects people, as we know, and other species as, uh, as poultry. In this diagram, I want to show you briefly the distribution of cases of influenza or isolates of influenza received at the University of Minnesota Diagnostic Lab. Um, this is uh, data from 2013, 2012. Uh, it goes all the way to 2008. But we can see uh, a lot of submissions uh, where we can isolate influenza. Again, I want to emphasize the point that it's very common. The other thing that I want to emphasize with this slide is the different colors that we see, which cannot be seen very well, but the different colors just illustrate the different types of influenza that are out there, the H1s and 1s, which would be in light blue, and then the different combinations, and we'll talk about this uh, later as well. But just keep in mind, and that's one of the challenging things that we will be talking about all this introduction of new viruses <laughs> into pigs and then how do we control and uh, eventually, hopefully, get rid, getting rid of it. The other point I want to uh, get across is that influenza is very costly. And uh, there are very limited numbers that they talk about the cost of influenza. We've seen numbers for PERS, but we have seen uh, very limited numbers on the cost of influenza. And these are just some of the ones that are uh, available uh, and published. Uh, the $3 per pig, when we just lose, look at influenza by itself, but commonly it's uh, influenza is associated with PERS or other diseases, $10. And another uh, study, which is an older study, as well, about $10. But my point being is that as the systems have started to look at the cost of influenza, they come to realize that it's very costly in their systems. And that's one of the main reasons why there is uh, all the push as well on taking more action to control influenza. So what's the current state? And I want to um, show uh, some take home messages and things that I want you to to, to, to remember after the session today, based on the research that we are doing at the University of Minnesota, some of the things that we are learning. The first thing, um, and here, again, we're trying to understand where are all these viruses, how do we get rid of the viruses, and what happens. The first point is that the gills that come in and the wind peaks can be a source of influenza virus, okay? So in a study that uh, we are completing at the university, we found that 11% um, in this study monitoring five farms for a year, uh, over 12% uh, of the gills uh, can be positive, okay? Again, it doesn't seem like a large number, but if it's an ongoing number, that it's enough to introduce, introduce new uh, viruses in the populations. At the same time, oops, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so in one end is that they can introduce viruses. At the other end is that they can maintain the viruses. And that's the point um, that uh, in this blue line is even after we introduce them, they can, depending on your management in the GDUs, they can become a reservoir of influenza. Okay? And then I'm mentioning this because as a producer, things that you can do has to do with isolating the gills and testing, which we will talk about later. But the point that I really want to emphasize is that the role of the piglets. Okay? The piglets, prior to winning, in particular those piglets at the end, that week before winning, they are one of the most important and less recognized source of influenza virus in the populations. And I think that's where we have to put the effort. We've done several studies to show that. That's one. This is another one that we just published. That again, farms, even though clinically 
we may not see anything, no cough or anything. The piglets just prior to winning that last week, that's where influenza stays. But how important is that uh, wind pig population? So we did a testing in 52 farms. That's the work of Dr. Uh, Matt Allerson when he was doing his PhD at the university. He monitored uh, work um, uh, in collaboration with producers and veterinarians in 52 farms. And what he, he found is that 44 of those uh, farms would at some point in time produce positive pigs. So about half of the farms uh, produce positive pigs that are influenza at weaning, okay? And then the distribution of the samplings would vary, but a significant number of groups that are weaned, they were producing um, positive uh, pigs, okay? And then an interesting case as well, finding, and this is the actual breakdown for each of the farms, and in green means that the results, uh, that farm was negative, and in red is the farm were positive. So we have cases in which maybe there was just one testing at the farm being positive, but other farms, they were positive every month that we would test. Again, this speaks about the role of this population in spreading, uh, in maintaining influenza in the, in the south farms, but then in spreading the influenza when we win the peaks off-site, okay? Um, it's hard to read uh, in this slide, um, but uh, so we subtype, we characterize the different influenza viruses in those populations, but the encouraging thing, at least in the south farms, is that once they get infected with a type, we didn't see a lot of variation, at least during those six months. So when they are infected with a type of influenza, they remain infected with a type of influenza. So from a, a prevention point of view or a thinking in terms of what vaccine to use, that should help. Um, to, to, to select, okay, which is a different scenario on what we see in the post winning. But anyways, that's my main point, the first thing that I want to get across, the role of the gills and the wind pigs that they play as a source of influenza virus and things that we will have to do to address that. The other thing I want to get across is that, again, the infections uh, in pigs um, after winning are highly prevalent. Uh, this is a study in which, again, farms were monitored for two years. They were in the Midwest. There were about 30-something 30, 30 farms. And then 90% of these farms were positive at some point in time during those uh, two years. So uh, why prevalent, okay? Only 10% uh, they were negative, okay? Uh, so, again, that just uh, illustrates how frequent influenza was found after winning. And then here we see a distribution throughout the year, uh, and we see basically that we could find influenza every single month when we were looking uh, for it. A lot of groups were negative, which is illustrated in green, but uh, many, they were still positive. But again, influenza is just not a seasonal infection that we just see it in the fall, in the spring. If we look for the viruses, is there year around, even if we don't see clinical signs. The most telling slide, though, that illustrates what happened in those road to finish populations is actually summarized in this slide. Each dot represents every time that a sample was taken. And in, in, in black means the results were negative. So the samples were taken, but they were negative. But in color, it shows that there was virus, and then the different colors show that the virus was different every, every time. So we have a scenarios in which, like in here, this farm in particular, uh, let's say in this third testing was yellow, it was uh, H1N1, two months later it was pink, what H1N2, and so on, and it changes, okay? And that really, really is the challenge of influenza, all these new variants, because one of the things that influenza virus does, it like, it likes to mix and match and then come up with new uh, viruses um, when the virus reassort together, okay? So that's what we see. We see this purpuri of viruses, in particular in the growth finish populations, okay? Which, that's the challenge of influenza, and that's where we see the cost of the infections when it comes down to mortality and delay growth and the feed conversion. 
Uh, the other thing we see is that the infections uh, in these groups can be prolonged, okay? At, uh, and I'm talking about the growing pigs. Um, we used to believe that influenza would come in in a farm and then it would, uh, everybody would get infected at the same time, we would hear cough, and then a week later pretty much the infection would be gone. So what we've shown actually it's not the case. The viruses like to stay there longer than we thought they would be. And this is just to illustrate this, uh, this is a grow finish, uh, a win to finish population in which when we look for the virus, let's say just taking uh, samples from the nasal, um, in the nasal swabs from pigs, we basically <laughs> found that for the first uh, three weeks, it's in blue. But then when we use oral fluids, like it's in this case, uh, we could actually find the virus up to 70 days. Again, and those are populations in which there is no other sources of virus. So that means that the virus is there and it's there, it's there, or it might be there in low quantity, and we just have to be looking for it. Uh, something similar in which this is a study funded by the National Poor Board in which we went and we want to understand why is that these viruses stay there for so long. And actually in this case, we were monitoring uh, over 100 pigs on a weekly basis um, individually, so we would take nasal swabs on a weekly basis. And what we can see uh, is actually we have spikes of infection. Like for example, in this case, 80 peaks of uh, 120, it's, uh, what is that, uh, about 60, 70% of peaks positive at once. So that's a lot of virus uh, uh, coming out from these, uh, from these uh, populations. I will not show you the data uh, that we have as well on aerosol transmission, but this is a virus that when the peaks get infected, they produce a lot of virus and then they shed a lot and infects others. But what my point here that I want to illustrate is that even in the same population, even though the pigs might be already infected once, there is a, a significant proportion of animals that they might be reinfected in the same finishing site. So even though they went through influenza one time, they might go through influenza again eight weeks later, okay? And right now we're trying to sort it out here whether it's new strains or just slightly different strains um, or similar strains that are already in the population. Again, in terms of um, uh, um, to illustrate how difficult it is. But the point as well that I want to, to drive home is that even for these long periods of time, there is a very low proportion of pigs, maybe one to two percent of the pigs, that will remain positive, and those will be the ones that they will be, if you ship them somewhere else in, to another farm or population, those will be the ones that they will move the viruses around, okay? So infection uh, in groups can be prolonged. Uh, the last but not least, and this is like as well a big elephant, in a room is in the role of people. Traditionally, from a public health perspective, we have always thought that the pigs are a source of viruses for the people, and they, we can be. I mean, sick people, um, sick pigs can be a source of viruses for people. But interestingly enough, here, people also represent uh, a source of virus for the pigs, which, again, we have to be very concerned about it. And there are many actual uh, studies now that show that, that the people, uh, the, the flu viruses that are found in people, first are found in people and then eventually they make it to the pigs. And that, that contributes to the level of uh, diversity that we find in, in pigs. Uh, we saw that very clearly when it happened the, uh, in 2009, the H1N1 pandemic virus that again infected pigs, uh, sorry, infected people would infect pigs. And there are multiple uh, reports on other types of viruses like DH3s and 2s and another combination of viruses. And then this is um, one that we have to recognize. And then also the fact that not all the strains are transmitted equally. And we'll talk about the role of people vaccination in particular and avoiding going to war when people are clinically uh, sick in order to prevent those infection to people, okay? 
So what can producers do? Uh, one of the things uh, we can do, and I didn't actually put it on the slides, it, uh, thinking in terms of the gills, I mentioned before gills can be a source of viruses. So the role of isolation, isolating the animals in isolation units or quarantine units and monitor for influenza and keeping them long enough that by the time you bring them in, you, they don't bring virus. Um, so using oral fluids or different testing schemes, that's one of things to do. The other thing uh, is vaccination of influenza. Fortunately, there are vaccines for influenza. Again, they might not be perfect, but they are a good tool that helps to uh, control clinical signs. They usually, uh, unless the vaccine matches very well the virus that might be in the farm, uh, transmission may not uh, be affected. And that's one of the challenges of vaccination. Uh, how we vaccinate populations, the traditional programs of pre in vaccination, uh, I will question this program, and we can discuss more about it. But the results on whole herd mass vaccination in which everybody is vaccinating, uh, vaccinated at, that at the same time, it seems to be a better way to actually prevent the spread of the virus within a population. That's something to think about. One of the challenges, though, for vaccination, and in particular if you think in terms of vaccinating the growing pig, is the interference with maternal uh, immunity. This is a slide showing the summary of a study in which they did the whole herd vaccination and then monitoring the pigs at weaning for three months after vaccination. And um, it's a busy slide, but the point, uh, the, so they were vaccinating in February and then in March, and you can see that actually the animals at weaning or at 14 days and then at weaning, they did not start going back to be negative until the second <coughs> vaccine in the whole herd had been applied. Again, it's a, it's a tool and something we have to learn more about on how to vaccinate those populations. Um, I would like to convince you that for flu, uh, we are behind uh, PERS in what it's understanding epidemiology and control of influenza, and we have to take also a PERS-like approach. And what I mean by that, is that we do need to understand where the viruses come from, okay? Uh, because one advantage is in the case of influenza, different than PERS, is that the viruses will die out fairly easily as long as we don't introduce many more viruses. So we have to understand that better. So understanding what happened at the sow farms, at the gills, and then at the sow farms, it's the point number one, in my opinion, uh, to produce that negative peaks at winning and then to minimize the amount of viruses that we see in, uh, in the post-winning. And then other strategies like hair closure or early winning or just the management piglet processing, let's say, um, uh, prior to those strategies, what's the effect uh, on uh, flu elimination or flu control? We need to learn that. Uh, I mentioned before the role of people, and I would like to en emphasize the implementation of seasonal vaccination uh, in farm personnel. I mean, again, and this is particularly important when there are new strains, uh, you know, in humans, the vaccines get updated. So there are those years in which the vaccine viruses don't match very well with uh, what may be circulating. So those are really the years where we are at risk of introducing new viruses in pigs, just because um, workers may be uh, shedding viruses. So emphasizing seasonal vaccination on farm personnel is, is very important, as well as avoiding uh, going to, to work if people feel sick um, and they have confirmed influenza. So all what you can do, and then also wearing gloves or protective, personal protective equipment, these things that we cannot uh, underestimate that we can do on the day to day. Okay? So what needs to be done? Of course, the better vaccines, but I will leave that to the vaccine companies to do that. But what we, do, uh, what we can do, we have actually tools that perhaps they are not perfect, but they are very good tools. The tools that we have nowadays commercially, they are very good tools in my opinion already. Again, not perfect, but a lot has to do in knowing how to, how to use them and who do we vaccinate and how frequently we have to vaccinate. So uh, we need more work on that. And understanding better uh, all this um, new strain introduction and how the viruses transmit and move uh, within farms and between farms, we need to understand that better. 
and then see what biosecurity uh, programs uh, will be helpful on, on preventing new viruses introductions. Okay, so with that, I think we can move forward, and, but I want to co convince you that influenza is a very important disease uh, because it is. It's very costly. Mm -hmm. I know control can be very uh, frustrating, but I look forward to the discussion today to help out. So thank you. Okay.